Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, the keen observer will note that I am not Governor Hickenlooper. Um, he, he sends his regrets uh, and was called away by a personal emergency. Um, my name is Mark Zoback. I'm a professor of geophysics at Stanford and the director of Stanford's Natural Gas Initiative. We have a, a terrific panel uh, this morning to discuss the topic of uh, updating everyone on hydraulic fracturing and regulation of oil and gas field practices. There's been a lot of talk this morning about the abundance of resources, and I think we all agree that um, in order to develop these resources, we have to do so in an environmentally responsible manner, and that's what we're going to be addressing um, in, this, in this panel discussion. Now, we have um, with us, uh, we have Jim Brown, the president of the Western Hemisphere for Halliburton, and I'm going to ask him to sort of tell us what's new with respect to field practice and, and, uh, and environmental protection. We have Fred Krupp, the president of the Environmental Defense Fund, and I'm going to ask him to address sort of what's happening on the regulatory front, uh, regulatory reform and uh, environmental protection associated with oil and gas field operations. And we have Dave Stover, the president and CEO, CEO of Noble Energy, um, and I'd like him to address sort of what, is it, what does this all mean for an oil and gas operator, uh, both in Colorado and uh, other parts of the United States and, in fact, the world. Um, there's one topic I'd like them all to uh, touch on because uh, a year ago at this meeting, we heard Governor Hickenlooper, along with the Environmental Defense Fund and three operators uh, in Canna, Noble Energy, and Anadarko, uh, announce uh, some very new and uh, significant uh, emission standards for oil for uh, on-site uh, operations, and I'd like to uh, have each of them sort of bring us up to date on uh, now that there's this has been in place for a year. What, is it, what does it mean for the people of Colorado, and what does it mean as sort of setting a new standard for operations elsewhere in the United States and indeed in other parts of the world? So let me turn it over to Jim, and uh, if you could bring us up to date on field practice and what's going on. Well, well thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mark. I, I, I think Tom, Tom Petrie uh, was very explicit in where we're at today. We're flush in North America in natural gas. Uh, we're approaching peak production in oil and uh, are, are almost independent from an oil perspective. So how did we get here? And, and without rehashing a lot, I believe there are three key components of technology that, have, that have, have gotten us to where we're at today. Certainly it was around the, adva the advancements in 3D seismic. And before putting dollars at risk of having a good feel for what the potential of that reservoir was and the reservoir valuation around 3D seismic. Secondly, and I think probably the, the key to where we're at today in the unconventionals is the ability to accurately place a well bore horizontally. Again, if you think about it, we're drilling down two miles in many cases and out two miles, staying within a couple of feet window in many cases and the ability to hit a coffee can. I mean, that's, that's space science. The, the telemetry that's used in that communication with the bottom hole assembly and obviously the advancements in the speed by which we could do that. And then third, is the third leg of that stool is really around hydraulic fracturing. And hydraulic fracturing is not a new process, and we've discussed this before. We uh, pion pioneered hydraulic fracturing back in uh, the 1940s, and that's when it was not spelled with a K for, for a lot of you <laughs> people out there. It was always spelled, it was fracturing, and it was short, and it was spelled with a C. But the basic process by which we pump water and sand at pressure to hydraulically fracture the rock and then propagate the rock to allow a channel for the oil and gas to come to the well bore has not basically changed since the 40s. What's changed is the efficiency around that operation and the scale. So if you look at what we've done today, we've, uh, in the efficiency game, because these unconventionals just will not work without scale and efficiency, We've introduced a new generation of hydraulic pumping equipment, low emission hydraulic pumping equipment that utilizes 20% less capital on location, 35% less people on location, a smaller footprint. Secondly, we introduced 24-hour operations to where 
were at the well site a shorter period of time, not just drilling the well, but also completing the well. Third, we worked in a collaborative effort with our customers to centralize our stimulation centers versus multiple operations on a lease. We centralized that operation to minimize the, the surface disturbance, both technically as well as mechanically, the ability to stimulate wells. Then finally, what was required to deliver the amount of technology today and the amount of stimulation that was done today was really to build a, a world-class, complex logistics model. Just to give you, give you a feel for that, uh, a year ago, 2014, we pumped almost 24 and a half billion pounds of propant in North America. Now the origination of that propant is in glacier mines, most of it in the upper Midwest. And to be able to build a machine that could move that propant from those mines, from Pennsylvania to Southern California, to the Permian, to the Eagleford, Bakken, the DJ Basin, was quite a task. And we developed real-time war rooms, if you will, centers where we could track a pound of sand from when it was mined, worked with the rail networks to, to figure out a way that we could effectively deliver that propant. We built new generation sand plants where we could load trucks in a matter of minutes versus hours to deliver that propant to our customers. So the efficiency was the name of the game. We'll advance forward, here we are, we've got oil cut by 53%. Um, drilling rigs will probably fall maybe below 900 in North America. That's over half of the drilling rigs are going to be gone this year with the price of oil. Our customers, our op, the operators, the oil and gas producers are, are cutting their, their, their capex uh, anywhere from uh, 30 to 50%. So now we're in a new environment. But if you look at the economics of oil and gas, outside of what you get for a barrel of oil and what it takes to transport it, it's pretty simple. It's how do you affect the cost per BOE? And I think as an industry, we've really addressed that numerator. We've squeezed about as much efficiency out of the equations that we, that we can. But there's another component, that's the denominator. We can actually lower the cost per BOE by improving production. And that's where we're focused today. How do we make Simply put, better wells. In the DJ Basin and the Niobrara, for example, at best we're getting 5 to 8% of the oil out of ground, er, oil in place out of the ground. That means we're leaving 95% of the oil in place. And candidly, the industry has been focused on that numerator, the cost side. But there's huge potential in terms of getting more oil out of the ground. I'll give you one example and then I'll be quiet, Mark. We've developed a process, uh, the commercial term is called access frack, but what it really is, is it's intercycle or interstage diversion. If you think of a lateral that's either 5,000 feet long or 10,000 feet long, we've broken that lateral up into bites that we could effectively stimulate. And that's usually isolated by external packers or plug and perf methods, but you still have to stimulate that isolated piece of the well bore. Within that piece of the well bore, there are perforation clusters. And when you start pumping a, a fracturing treatment, that treatment generally will go to the path of least resistance. You end up wasting a lot of product. In other words, you're going into a partially depleted zone or non-productive zone without effectively treating the productive side. So we've developed a biodegradable diverting agent that we can pump in, in real time and direct that frack. In other words, by looking at the pressure response, we can determine what is taking the fracturing fluid, re-divert that to other producing rock. So you think about it, we're distributing the capital now more effectively along that lateral. And we're creating fracture complexity along that lateral. I'll cut to the end. Uh, about six months ago, we had two major operators in the Bakken. They converted completely over to this process. We just uh, received information on six-month production. And again, this is a big player. The well production was up 36% over where we were at 
six months ago. We now have campaigns going in the DJ Basin, the Niobrara. We've been active now about eight months in the Eagleford in South Texas. And those are the things that can make a difference in this new environment of low oil price. It's focusing on how do we get more out of each well. So if you look at Halliburton, we spend about three quarters of a billion dollars a year on R&D. And a lot of that has been directed towards surface efficiency, safe, responsible surface efficiency. We're now directing those dollars to subsurface insight. Again, simply put, how do we get more out of each well? Thanks. Fred, what's happening on the regulatory front? Well, there's a lot of uh, good momentum, Mark, uh, to clean up um, some of these processes and some of the operators that haven't been as good. Um, you know, as you all know, and I'm not going to spend time enumerating it, there's a lot of economic benefits of natural gas. And we heard uh, Secretary Rice last night give a wonderful presentation about the national security benefits, as well as the eco some of the economic benefits. We've heard more of that this morning. But, uh, and there are environmental benefits as well to lowering conventional pollution from the one-third of our natural gas, which is used to produce electricity. Uh, there's environmental benefits in terms of lowering the carbon dioxide emissions compared to burning coal. But there are also very real environmental challenges, and they haven't been solved. Uh, but my three-part update um, is that we do have some good momentum on solving them. Uh, first, I'll talk for a second about disclosure of the frac fluids that are going down the hole, uh, the great progress that's been made, but the additional steps that we needed. Second, I'll talk about the well integrity. Um, there, the progress we've made and the additional progress needed. And third, I'll come back to your question about Colorado and air pollution. So first, very briefly, on um, frac fluids, uh, several states uh, have had um, initiated disclosure requirements before 2011, when Jim Brown from Halliburton was constructively involved with EDF and others, to put in place a new system in Colorado. And in order to protect trade secrets of, of the companies, the individual formulas of the um, particular components of the frac fluid weren't required to be disclosed, the formulas of uh, what's in there. But all the chemical identities each of the chemical uh, that were used overall in aggregate is required to be disclosed. And now we have over two dozen states that have adopted very similar requirements so that neighbors can know most of the chemicals that are being used down the hole um, during the frac job. That's good. Um, however, um, it's not working as intended. More than half the wells in this country, according to Frac Focus, still hide the identity not of the formulas of Super Frac X, which you can hide, but you're supposed to disclose what all the components are in Super Frac X with all the other components. And still in half the wells, there are components that are being um, hidden, chemical names being hidden. 16% of all the component chemicals are not yet being disclosed in a way that's identified on frac focus. So that's progress uh, left to be done. And we also need to have um, better disclosure of chemicals that are used later after the fracking is done. Um, and uh, that's just beginning to be required. Secondly, then, um, on well structure, it's true what industry says, that almost no cases can be found of chemical contamination of aquifer uh, due to chemicals leaking out of the fractures. But what's not true is there's been almost no contamination. There's been thousands of cases where drinking water has been spoiled and, in fact, needed to be replaced because of spills on the surface or because of a well shaft that is not cemented uh, properly with integrity. Uh, now we have Ohio and Texas, uh, many states have um, updated the well integrity guidelines. So that's been really good progress. We're not finished. Not every state has. Not every state's done as much as should be done. This, this um, work EDF did with Southwestern Energy was really pivotal in this. We came up with a model regulatory uh, code, which has been adopted now in many of these states. And the third area uh, is air pollution. And here, uh, the greatest progress has been made right here in Colorado, 
thanks to um, Governor Hickenlooper, but also thanks to Noble Energy, uh, Dave um, and his uh, predecessor. Uh, thanks also to Anandarko uh, and, um, and Canna. We just saw Al and Doug on stage. Um, these guys, uh, along with the governor, uh, participated in a process that was really constructive a year and a half ago and resulted in the first regulation in the country on methane uh, here in Colorado. It was approved a year ago in February. It's going really well. Thanks to that regulation, it's now on the books. It's being used by companies. Companies are required to go out and do leak detection and repair. About 90,000 uh, tons of methane are being reduced from the air in Colorado every year. 100,000 tons of volatile organic chemicals, as much as is emitted by all the cars and the trucks in Colorado, has been taken out of the air in Colorado, so the air is uh, getting cleaner. Um, this is a really effective thing. What's left to be done here is uh, the EPA has proposed um, a weaker um, uh, thing for the whole country to do, while they've proposed we reduce emissions by 45% by 2025, too long in my viewpoint, uh, they've proposed only dealing with the new wells. Here in Colorado, we're dealing with the new and the existing infrastructure. So there's some work needs to be done to get this Colorado model adopted, both by EPA, dealing with existing infrastructure, as well as um, to get the other states um, to do it as well. So that's the update. Thanks. Great. Dave? Work. Try to pull all that together? Yes. <laughs> what, is it, what, it, what does it mean for an operator? Yeah, I, I think from an operator perspective, you, you think about it, and it's been touched on earlier this morning. Jim touched on it a little bit. But just the resurgence, renaissance, whatever you want to call it in the U.S., with this unconventional plays that started with the gas, that's developed and expanded with the oil, and just the resource potential that we have in this country now. I mean, for us, we have about 60% of our business in the U.S. and about 40% international. And you can see the geopolitical implications to what the Secretary referred to last night and, and just how it changes the dialogue between countries with this resource potential. Now, at the same time, you know, right now we're going through a, a rapid decrease in commodity price as an industry. And first reaction has been to cut activity back dramatically, as Jim talked about, cutting capital levels a good bit, focus on bringing costs down. But to me, I think what's going to be one of the interesting aspects of going through this period, I think you're going to see a big refocus on technology and innovation. I think each cycle we've gone through in the past, and you can go back and look at it and see how we've come out of them, there's been significant advances in technology and innovation that continues to push us forward on all sides. You know, whether it's subsurface, surface, or integration through transportation systems. I think when you look back at it, and to put it in perspective, you know, if you look at how rapid this change has been. I think it was shown, I think Rob showed it earlier this morning, just in the last five years, the rapid growth here in the U.S. Well, you think about energy development over time, and to put it in perspective over, say, the last 30 years or so, 35 years that I've been in this business, and what it's done and what it's contributed in the world, when you, you think about things out there in medicine and the advances in medicine, you think about food supply, and how that's changed in the world. Access to resources. There's an underpinning of all of that that's tied to energy development. And so there's a, a tremendous opportunity here to continue to make advances that's gonna continue to change and improve quality of life going forward. But in order to continue to do that, to have that license to operate, you have to have the public trust and understanding. And I think here's where this rapid change over the last five years, you know, we as an industry have probably been slow to react to understanding and create that understanding in the public of what we're really doing and how we're doing it. I think any lack of understanding leads to a lack of confidence and lack of trust. And that's what we've been working on and, and in combination with Anna Darko here in Colorado, 
For example, we started a couple of years on working on just an education program with the public, and that'll continue. That's just part of our business now. Along with developing oil and gas, it's, it's continuing to educate on what are we doing and how are we doing it, and how should, why should the public be confident and comfortable with how we're developing resources. I think many examples you can point to, one that Fred talked about was, was working together and, and bringing parties with different opinions, different viewpoints, coming at it from different angles together to find common ground to resolve and, and address issues. You know, one of them was this air emission piece here. How, how do we take progressive action and move forward and send an example in Colorado that really addresses underneath that the public confidence in how we operate? And in that, and it gets back to how you address that, you set it up so you're monitoring, you're detecting, and if you find a problem, you own up to it and you fix it. And I think that's what continues to build that, that confidence and trust. I think another example we put in place, I think about a year ago with Colorado State University, a process to do real life, real time monitoring of groundwater in and around oil and gas operations. We've got five wells out there, five pilot wells, if you will, that are real time monitoring groundwater and looking for any changes. Again, that gets back to how do you provide real data, real information that gets to that confidence in how you're operating. So I, I think there's numerous examples like that, but the bottom line is we've got a tremendous opportunity in this country to really change the way we interact in the world, to change the way we interact as far as our own security, and we need to make sure that we take advantage of that. And the only way we can take advantage of that is to work together on all fronts to make sure we're doing that in a safe and responsible manner and everybody believes in that. Thank you. And I, and I think we heard it in the context of Mexico this morning, but it's true everywhere these unconventional resources are present around the world, and we heard from Rob how abundant they are, that uh, the whole world is watching what happens in the United States and North America in general. And if we can set a standard for sustainable development, other countries will, will follow that standard. You know, Mark, uh, maybe a little bit out of order here, but um, we heard Secretary Rice last night talk about the irony that Europe isn't developing its shale resources. And when I go to Europe, they're always asking about earthquakes. And you asked me for a regulatory update. I omitted talking about earthquakes because I'd feel silly doing that when we have the world's leading expert in induced seismicity here. Can you give us, uh, we've all been reading about earthquakes in Oklahoma. What is, what is the regulatory update? Are regulations changing? Who's the moderator here, anyway? I thought you were um, getting off this panel, uh, didn't you? OK, I'll, I'll answer the question. I want to invite the audience, uh, if you do have questions, to pass them forward. We have a limited amount of time. And while I'm answering Fred's question, um, um, we'll be happy to uh, answer uh, those of the audience. So um, I get asked questions like, well, what do I think about a moratorium on hydraulic fracturing in California because of all the earthquakes being triggered by hydraulic fracturing in Oklahoma? And of course, as everyone knows, uh, you know, earthquake hazard is a, is a big issue in California. And we don't want to make that worse. Um, it, you know, there are cases in which hydraulic fracturing has uh, triggered earthquakes, and one way to think about it is we've drilled roughly 150,000 wells, roughly a mile long, in North America, and hydraulically fractured them multiple times. So in 150,000 miles of subsurface drilling, we've hit a few faults and triggered a few earthquakes. It's, there's about a dozen well-documented cases, mostly in Canada, a couple in Ohio. We know how to solve this problem. We know how to use 3D seismic data, identify these faults, and when you're hydraulically fracturing, just to skip that part of the well and avoid that problem. Another way that uh, hydraulic fracturing operations have uh, caused earthquakes is that after hydraulic fracturing, you flow the water back out of the well. In a gas well, for example, you want to get the water out of the way so the gas can flow. The water that comes back is contaminated by the uh, composition of the shales themselves. It comes back, it's very saline, it often has iron, selenium, arsenic, other um, uh, toxic materials. And it's typically 
injected into uh, what are called EPA class two wastewater injection wells. Now there are 140 some thousand of these wells that have been operating for many decades without incident, but some of those wells are seeing larger injection volumes and some of those wells, a well-documented case in Arkansas, the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, Youngstown, Ohio, for example, have been places where these uh, wastewater injection wells have triggered earthquakes. We know how to address that problem as well. Um, none of those wells, none of the 140,000 existing wells had any consideration of the potential for triggering earthquakes. There was no site characterization uh, in their siting. Uh, the only requirements were really with respect to well construction, which are logical and, and important, but more could be done easily in many of these cases to avoid the problem. Now that brings me to Oklahoma, which is particularly interesting because Oklahoma is now uh, having more magnitude three and four earthquakes than California. Now as a Californian, I'm greatly offended by this. Um, <laughs> we don't have any tornadoes. They don't have to have tornadoes and, and earthquakes. Um, it turns out the, the, the situation in, in sort of north central Oklahoma is extremely serious. Uh, the background rate of magnitude four earthquakes the size of an earthquake, which is widely felt throughout the state, um, a decade ago was one such earthquake roughly every 10 years. Okay, one magnitude four earthquake felt throughout the state every decade. Last year they had 24. So almost every two weeks somebody is feeling an earthquake due to oil and gas activities. Uh, my students and I have recently shown that this is actually due to a a special kind of play in Oklahoma, uh, a type of oil development that was you know, profitable because oil prices were high, in which oil and water were produced from horizons that actually produce about 50 to 100 barrels of water for every barrel of oil. Now, in cases in which oil, water and oil are developed together, it's usually a case in which the water is recycled back into the same formation. Uh, it's called enhanced oil recovery or a water flood. So you, you take the oil and water out, you separate the oil and water, the oil gets um, you know, produced and the water gets re-injected. In those cases, you don't get earthquakes because there's no mass balance. But what's been happening in Oklahoma is roughly a billion barrels a year of salt water disposal is being injected into a saline aquifer right above the basement. It's changing the pressure in that aquifer, it's finding active faults down in the crystalline basement, and it's triggering these earthquakes. The interesting thing about this is that these wells have no hydraulic fracturing in general, and yet the tremendous number of earthquakes are assumed to be associated with hydraulic fracturing because unfortunately in the public's mind, hydraulic fracturing has sort of become a metaphor for all oil and gas operations and anything that can possibly go wrong is obviously, in their mind, um, unfortunately associated with hydraulic fracturing. So we have, a, we have an education process uh, that um, is going to be going on for quite some time. So like many of the other um, environmental impacts of oil and gas operations, as, as Dave said, we have to identify what the problems are, figure out how to solve them, and then, and then move on. Um, as I make my way through these questions, I do want to ask um, both um, Fred and Jim um, a question. You know, what do, we knew, what do we need to do to do a better job of reducing methane emissions, uh, both at the well site during hydraulic fracturing operations and through the, the distribution system where, unfortunately, a, a lot of methane seems to be emitting being emitted, and uh, it's a potent greenhouse gas. It's, it obviates the benefit of switching from coal to natural gas. So while I'm sorting through this, if you could address that problem, I'd appreciate it. One thing that's, that's good about this, Mark, is it's, it's plumbing. We're talking about the gas leaking out of pipes, and we're talking about pipes that the valves don't fit right, or there's uh, pneumatic devices that are shooting out methane intentionally that can be replaced by low bleed or no bleed uh, devices. We're talking about uh, pumps that um, the packing around the rods uh, degrades over time. ICF International did a study commissioned by EDF, but using company data, 
um, showed you could get 40% of the leaks reduced in the United States for a cost of one cent per thousand cubic feet. So there's a lot of things that can be done very inexpensively. Leak detection and repair, which is part of the Colorado program. Yeah, what we're doing in Colorado is very cost effective. The bigger operators have to do it monthly. The smaller well pads sometimes only once. So it's, it's geared toward the operator. So there's really cost effective solutions. My view is we need regulations like in Colorado that are requiring this to happen in a pragmatic way. We now need them nationally. And my hope is that the oil and gas industry will engage with EPA pragmatically the way they did here in Colorado. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add a general comment. I, I think the system works, and, and Fred's a great example of it. He, he brings real concerns of, of problems and dangers to the table based on science and fact. But in addition, he looks for solutions to that, pragmatic solutions that we can work together on. As it relates to emissions, I, you know, that's really a, a question for the operators. As it relates to hydraulic fracturing, an issue around the amount of propent that we move is silica dust. And several years ago, we realized that. And we started engineering equipment that mitigated silica dust, including specific ground built up dust mitigation. So you go out onto a Halliburton location today, and there are several ways to monit monitor that silica dust component. And we're well below the OSHA standards. And again, there's a great example of a potential problem that we work together on solving to keeping the machine moving. We have limited time, so I'd like to ask uh, everyone to keep their answers short, but we have some very good questions. Could any of you comment on the real step change that is needed across the country to have better success with the conversations and outreach by industry with the public about the safety record and transparency of industry? Dave, could you take a shot at that? Yeah, well, I, I think transparency is extremely important. I think the collaboration is important. I mean, I, I think even, for example, here, what the governor put together on this task force, where it brought 21 different individuals with different backgrounds, different perspectives, different concerns, if you will, together. And they didn't reach agreement on everything, but you saw agreement reached on some major items. So, I mean, that's progress. But you have to bring people together. People have to be willing to listen and engage. Another part of that same question is, it seems there are some pockets of continuous improvement. But what is the jam up in this effort to help so that the thing that people fear can be better understood? Fred, how do we uh, you know, turn continuous improvement, something uh, we've both uh, written about, um, how do we make the public understand that there really is an effort to, you know, to continuously take steps that better protect them from the impacts of oil and gas development? Mark, when you and I were uh, on the seven-person commission to chart a safe path forward to develop shale, we reported to the chair, uh, John Deutsch, the former head of our country's CIA. And his answer, I think, is better than any original one I have, so I'll give you John Deutsch's answer which is we have to do the monitoring, like the monitoring of the silica dust, the monitoring of the methane, on, on the monitoring of what's getting into the groundwater real time, as what David Stover has just described. Make the data available, and that's what the public's trust needs to be based on. The spin campaigns and the rhetoric, pardon me, um, aren't going to do it. It's got to be factual data based on more ubiquitous monitoring that's the key. And that's what transparency yes. really means. The final question I'll, I'll pass on to Jim, uh, and, but it's one that I, I think I know the answer, but I, I'm also affected by uh, the situation. And it's with California in a drought, threatening drinking water supplies, will oil and gas development and hydraulic fracturing in particular be affected significantly? Well, I think when you, when you look at water usage in the grand scheme of things, and you've seen the comparisons to what's used on golf courses, what's used to irrigate, hydraulic fracturing is really a small part of that water usage. But back to my earlier comments, 
technology today is how can we accomplish more with less product? And we're, we're very sensitive, obviously, to the amount of water we use. So to give you an example of technologies around water usage is reusing water, fracturing water, using the chemistry to clean that water and reuse it again. And we have several recycle stations set up throughout the United States in the middle of these, these big unconventional basins by which we uh, can recycle water. I, I want to bring up one other point, I think, that, that really um, describes what we need to look at. Hydraulic fracturing in itself, due to what Fred talked about, it's like any industrial operation. You're going to have spills. We've got to mitigate those spills. Any type of energy use has a consequence, and it's our job to mitigate that and make sure we're transparent about it. But when it comes to oil and gas operations, I think just one area we have to put more emphasis on is the integrity of the wellbore. After all, that wellbore passes through shallow zones. That's where the risk comes in of potentially contaminating any, any type of those shallower zones where, where groundwater exists. And pragmatic regulation around well construction, which is really a small part of the total process is really cheap insurance in terms of how we can ensure that we have well integrity for the life of that well, 20, 30, 40 years. Well, we're out of time. I'd like to thank the panel, thank the audience, and uh, welcome everyone to lunch. <laughs>